My name's Mark Clark. I want to talk to you about Camp K, why A to Z doesn't work. This is Camp K. It's one of the largest refugee camps in the world. It's home to families from different tribes in conflict with each other who fled their homes amid intense and protracted fighting. I work for a peace-building organisation and one of our volunteers lives close to the camp and he wanted to start a programme to address issues of conflict and violence inside the camp, but also with a view to transforming relationships between the tribes and building capacity to manage conflict so that those benefits could also be carried to the broader region when people returned home from the camp. So Ali planned an ambitious programme to engage with the tribal chiefs in the camp but also to bring together male youth from the different tribes to participate in sport-based games integrated with peace-building education to build relationships and break stereotypes and foster greater understanding and trust. Ali set out an A to Z plan with a detailed activity schedule for a progressive series of activities building over a year a detailed budget and detailed metrics to measure the impact. As he drove to the camp to get started, he was really excited and he felt ready. But on arrival at the camp, he was prohibited from even accessing the camp itself. The camp officials saw no apparent need for a peace building program and all his overtures were met with disinterest and suspicion. He realized he wasn't getting anywhere with this A to Z approach. It had immediately hit a brick wall. He recognized that he had to let go of that A to Z approach. And instead he had to be more adaptive. And his first task was purely to gain entry into the system and to build relationships within it. He identified child health as one of the priority concerns for the refugees in the camp. So in fact, he started a health programme for children and mothers in the camp. Nothing to do with peace building. The programme grew really quickly and Ali and his fellow volunteers became welcomed and well known in all the different tribal sectors of the camp. Most of the families in the camp were headed by women because the men had been killed or were still fighting or had stayed behind to secure their property. So talking with the mothers, Ali learned that one of the things they wanted was more activities for their children so that they themselves could have more free time to make handicrafts, to sell, to earn income. This was Ali's opportunity to start his original sport-based activity plan. So he trained some more volunteers and began sport-based activities for boys in the camp bringing together boys from different tribes, the activities grew quickly and spread to all the different tribal uh, sectors in the camp. The sport-based games allowed the mothers the time for their income generation activities, but they also enabled the boys to come together often for the first time to meet other boys from different tribes, to break down those stereotypes and to build new understanding across tribal divides. Over several months, the activities were well observed by the tribal chiefs, who also valued highly the feedback from the mothers about their newfound free time and increased income. So at the request of the mothers, and having gained some acceptance with the tribal chiefs, Ali proposed the possibility of extending the sport-based activities to girls also, something completely unacceptable in that very conservative local culture. The chiefs were really resistant to this and they gave several reasons why it couldn't be possible. The activities would be, have to uh, be facilitated purely by females. They couldn't take place within the sight of men. They couldn't require immodest clothing and so on. So Ali listened and came up with solutions for each of those objections. And eventually two of the chiefs agreed at least to a pilot demonstration. So Ali trained 
female volunteers to organise very simple sport-based games for girls. Canvas sheets were put up between tents to create an open area large enough for group activities which could take place out of the sight of male observers. The chiefs were so impressed with their demonstration that gradually they allowed the sport activities for girls to extend to all the different tribal sectors of the camp. This adaptive approach over two years, using the health programme and then the sport activities, eventually gained Ali the credibility to begin to engage at a serious level with the tribal chiefs, to begin substantive dialogue with them on their hopes and dreams for the future, and to break down those barriers between the different tribes and get them really to engage with each other. So my work supports volunteers like Ali in 50 countries, each of them as volunteers leading change to address issues of conflict and violence at local level in their own communities. As volunteers, they lack the authority or power to command change. As change agents, they're trying to find what influence they can bring to bear on their local situation to support the conditions for change rather than forcing it. Along the way, we've picked up some lessons that I think are useful in other contexts also for you as change agents, whether in organisations or in communities. So at first, Ali couldn't understand why those camp officials didn't share his sense of urgency and opportunity for the programme. When we encounter a new system, whether it's an organisation or a community, there may be many aspects of its behaviour that to us with our eyes seem completely absurd or irrational. We may even say this organisation or community seems completely dysfunctional. But it's important to remember that the system is functioning perfectly according to its own dynamics. Even a protracted conflict, a terrible situation, is in fact a perfectly functioning system held in equilibrium with forces sustaining it. The system does make perfect sense to itself, even if it doesn't yet make sense to us. So our first task is to build relationships within the system and to broaden and, our, and deepen our understanding of it. Models are useful for that. And George Box famously said, all models are wrong, but some are useful. Surely multiple models are even more useful. They help us suspend our preconceptions and our own world view. And by embracing multiple models, we can gain multiple perspectives, each of which may just be a metaphor, but may give us useful insights. In our work, we found three models to be consistently useful in different contexts. You can try them out in your own organisations. The first one is transformative dialogue. A simple process that begins with the question, who needs to talk to whom? About what, why and how? Usually those conversations require many cups of tea and coffee. The next model is the five colours model, I think familiar from CCC. They're helping us think through five different lenses, socio-political, rational, emotional, learning and systems dynamics. And the four dimensions of conflict help us think through personal capacity issues, relational issues between people, structural issues put in place by rules or norms, and cultural issues around deep values and identity. It's worth trying these models both descriptively and prescriptively. Descriptively to gain a deeper understanding of the current situation, and prescriptively to identify possible courses for action and entry into the system. When we realise that we don't understand the system fully, then we throw away that A to Z plan. We realise that we simply can't go on pretending that we can plan that far ahead. 
letting go of that plan, that A to Z linear thinking is difficult because it's the way we've been educated, it's probably the way we've been rewarded in our organisations. But letting it go does give us the freedom then to focus on the immediate achievable objectives. So for Ali, when his first step failed, his adaptive approach identified a completely different demand-driven achievable objective, B. And when he arrived at B, he took a fresh scan of the situation and saw what had changed. New relationships, new knowledge about the system, new opportunities. And he was able to identify the next objective, C. And so his programme took a completely emergent stepping stone approach, always in the general direction of trying to engage with the different tribes, but taking the opportunities as they arose. It wasn't in Ali's original plan to address gender equity or to empower girls and women, but that was one of the emergent opportunities that he was able to seize along the way. When we let go of the A to Z plan, we can also let go of that impulse to try to change the entire system. Gareth Morgan's research predicts that an individual can only have influence over 15% of the world around them. That seems really depressing at first. You can't control 85% of the world around you. But if you can accept that, then it becomes hugely liberating. You stop trying to change the whole world and you focus your energies on the 15% where you really do have direct influence. As a change agent, you use your 15% to set the context for other people to use their 15% influence. And over time, with persistence, these small incremental steps aggregate to build up enough momentum to overcome the inertia of the status quo and get a shift to reach a tipping point where a real sustainable change can be secured. Ali was initially faced with that complete cultural prohibition against females taking part in sports activity. But through dialogue, dialogue with the tribal chiefs, he was able to generate more options for action, to transcend their different perspectives and find a solution that was acceptable to all of them. Often in conflict, one aspect of identity becomes prioritised and communication becomes oversimplified and polarised. And if we only have a very limited view of the situation, then we have very limited options for action. If we can work to expand our view, to add in more complexity, then we can begin to generate many more possibilities. In our work in social systems in conflict, we need to be present for people. We need to be there in the communities for the long term. We need to build relationships of trust. We need to listen. And of course, we have to be present to be able to react adaptively and to take those emergent opportunities as they arise. In our practice, we need to let go of that A to Z thinking. We need to stop thinking we can change the entire system in one go. We need to embrace multiple models and we need to support people to re-expand that collapsed complexity. And our performance as a change agent is not a person who has power, but a person who listens, who facilitates, who can support people to broaden their vision, be open to new perspectives, to shift their attitudes and change their behaviour for a better future. Thank you very much.